Good morning. Okay, we're awake. This is good. Today, our New Horizon Forum theme will explore current activities in Air Force research and development. Research into new and emerging technologies has made possible most of the systems that we build and that we operate today, and really does help us preserve our technological edge. So it's my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce to you Major General Neil McCasland. Neil is the commander of Air Force Research Laboratory. General McCasland has a deep background in national space systems design, in development, in space operations, Air Force research activities, and DOD special programs. He's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy in Astro Engineering and holds both a master's degree and a Ph.D. in Aero and Astro Engineering from MIT. He'll share with us this morning his thoughts on big bets in U.S. Air Force research and development. Neil, welcome to the stage. Hey, well, good morning. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many here for uh, the morning class. Um, you know, I uh, uh, was warned that the, uh, the 8 o'clock hour might not see too many people uh, showing up, but uh, we're all engineers, and uh, I know that we all grew up uh, uh, going to early class and not waiting to noon like the uh, social sciences students. Uh, so uh, it's a real treat for, for me to get to, uh, to try to outline for you uh, what we are doing in the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, and in our effort to create new choices uh, for our Air Force. Let's see if this is uh, advancing yet. Oh, it's on the side. There we go. I'm sorry. Aha. Aha. It's not behind me. Here we go. Okay, so this is us. This is us, the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, our unit, uh, our mission is to uh, lead uh, invention, proof, test, um, and uh, integration of affordable war winning technologies for all the things that our Air Force uh, does. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, so I want to just start off uh, with, uh, with a little bit of context setting, uh, and you know, no military officer can uh, get off the stage without at least one wiring di diagram, and I want to talk just a little bit about who we are just to kind of orient you. Uh, the Materiel Command for the United States Air Force has had a substantial restructure, and this is what it looks like now if you haven't uh, seen that. Uh, what had been uh, 12 distinct centers across the country uh, have now been consolidated into five centers. Uh, we are one of those five centers uh, leading uh, science and technology. Others lead uh, development, sustainment, uh, the nuclear enterprise, uh, and, and test. Um, geographically, uh, our laboratory is distributed uh, here. About half of us at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, uh, other big concentrations at Kirtland, at Eglin, in Washington, in Rome, New York, uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, uh, this uh, a bit historic, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's the laydown of Air Force research activities, as you may have known uh, over the years, organized uh, some 15 years ago uh, into uh, a single organization uh, and, and now one of the five centers in Materiel Command. A uh, little bit about our demographics, because uh, ultimately laboratory is about the people there. Uh, we have a workforce of about 10,000. You can see the, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the data on uh, the distribution between uh, civilian, military, organic contractors. A uh, high proportion of our workforce is uh, science and engineering qualified and educated, a high fraction of that uh, with, with advanced degrees. Uh, but one of the things that I'm the proudest of uh, in, in our laboratory is, uh, is the demographics about years in service. And if you look down to the lower right, uh, the, uh, the histogram of the fraction of our workforce that is within its first decade of their professional service. And this reflects uh, a commitment to, uh, uh, to recruitment and to uh, creating the conditions that attract uh, new talent uh, into, the, uh, into the Defense Department and the Air Force and the part of our laboratory uh, over the past decades. And it's something that really brings a vitality that I'm proud of uh, in our laboratory. Tell you a little bit about, uh, just uh, to finish this stage setting, uh, you know, how we're organized. Our laboratory is technically organized. The rest of Materiel Command is product organized. You find uh, product centers and program offices dedicated to particular programs, particular missions. We're organized in a, in a conscious decision around technical competencies, uh, nine technical directorates. Here's a chart that lists uh, uh, who they are uh, and what their, what their competencies are. Uh, an interesting um, 
uh, new, uh, uh, new evolution of our laboratory is, is really around the Human Effectiveness Directorate, which is, a, which is an area of research we've had for a long, long, long time. Um, but with the, uh, the integration of the, uh, the Brooks Medical Team, the School of Aerospace Medicine, into a new composite unit that we call the, uh, uh, the 7-Eleven Human Performance Wing, uh, we've really got a, uh, a much stronger uh, technical focal point for this uh, interesting combination of human cognition, human effectiveness, um, medical research, teaching, and consultation. Now, I'm here really to talk about the science and technology and engineering aspects of that, but it is an interesting complexion of how our laboratory has changed uh, over, the, over just uh, recent years. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what we produce as a laboratory and how we produce it. And, and this is, a, this is a, 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 an abstraction of a, a, of a, of a transfer function, if you would, from you know, resources through people into uh, the execution uh, paths uh, and the, uh, the, the products that we produce as a laboratory. In round numbers, the research laboratory has got around $5 billion to work with, a little less than half of it programmed directly by the Air Force, which is what I'm going to get to uh, in this talk about what the Air Force's big bets are. Uh, and interesting enough, about that much again, uh, which uh, comes in our door from resource managers and program managers across defense and the intelligence community who look to us to execute, uh, and our workforce of the some 10,000 of us execute that work. Uh, in the column on the far right of this, are um, kind of my uh, my idealization of the products that we produce, and and, you, and you'll recognize those uh, from from basic research and, and scientific conclusions that are distributed in uh, in scientific papers and journals and new knowledge, um, to um, uh, a kissing cousin of intellectual property, uh, which is largely distributed into industry and users as uh, uh, engineering design codes from everything from uh, finite element models of canopies to spacecraft charging uh, to uh, uh, serpentine inlet uh, design codes and, and turbine design codes, th uh, things that represent a, an immediate transfer of, of, um, of, of learning and application and, and cost avoidance to industry that uses it. Uh, and, that's a, and that's a distinct product. The kind of things that we typically think about laboratories, uh, technology-based and advanced demonstrations, um, are um, uh, the next two icons. And this, of course, is uh, the invention and the prototyping and the proofing of new devices and new device physics into components that can be integrated into systems. And then a set of those will actually carry into flight test into the operational environment to go validate and verify that uh, what we've been researching actually hangs together. Lastly, occasionally we are asked to field things directly into the battlefield uh, because we've got the talent for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, creating uh, revolutionary capabilities that uh, uh, the, the field commander is worth wants to experiment with, and we've got some remarkable things over in the battlefield, uh, the Blue Double ISR package, for example, and some counter IED experiments that, uh, that we'll send straight into the user's hands. So with that as kind of a, a thumbnail of the products, if you look down the middle column, this starts to break down where we execute and, and put some, uh, uh, some resource values around uh, the kind of places that we look to uh, for execution. And you know, in round numbers of the five billion that we've got, we execute about four-fifths of that extramurally, uh, and about a fifth of that uh, organically in-house to either run our infrastructure, run our organic research program, uh, and the labor and the program management oversight for extramural program. Uh, looking at the top, you can see that we'll, uh, we'll invest around a quarter of a billion dollars a year uh, in academia for basic research. Uh, but the bulk of our money goes into industry. Uh, and you can see in the two, um, the, the two middle blocks uh, a distinction between uh, small business size and, and industry, um, uh, the rest of industry. Uh, and it shows you that, uh, that most of that money that we have is really turning into the venture capital for the defense industry to create new choices uh, for the Air Force. Um, just as a footnote, uh, down on the bottom, uh, I've, uh, I've also accounted for uh, the fraction of our work that has uh, gone into uh, um, uh, uh, U.S. activities for international collaboration, just as a point of reference. Now, when we, uh, when we start looking at, uh, at how S&T pays off, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to audit uh, immediately because it is really a consequence of, of when does the Air Force pick up uh, new choices. Uh, and this, uh, gosh, I'm afraid the, the resolution in this may not be uh, uh, as legible as I hope. I hope it's better on the bigger screen. But as we look back over our shoulder over even 30 years and ask where did 
Air Force Science and Technology investments make a difference. Here's a way to roll that up and look at a weapon system that's in operations today uh, and see where past big bets placed by research have turned into capability that we use. Um, it's uh, it's uh, an interesting exercise to try to account for where the bets are going today. Um, that's a judgment call that I'll uh, have to wait for um, uh, you know, you know, uh, future years uh, to assess, but uh, um, you can, uh, you can uh, get a pretty good idea by looking uh, through examples like this. And I'll also just uh, give a big shout out uh, to Rebecca Grant in an article that she wrote in Air Force uh, about two months ago. It was specifically about engines, but it also did just a remarkably nice job of looking back over the history of big bets made in science and technology investments and the difference it made in uh, combat jet engines. So, um, getting to what you've actually invited me to talk about today, I want to start now peeling through the uh, roughly $2 billion of investment that the Air Force is making uh, in science and technology and start trying to show you where those are concentrated in forms of our big bets. In round numbers, our laboratory manages some 600 individual projects of a million dollars or larger and some 6,000 uh, specific, uh, uh, specific projects that we track. And so, you know, when, when Zach Lemonios came out to his first visit and he said, look, I'd, I'd like you to brief me on, on all of your projects, we said, well, it's going to take three weeks. Uh, and he said, fine, uh, I'll spend three weeks. And he did. Um, Tom has not given me three weeks, uh, mercifully for you. Um, so I'll have to go uh, step through this in the form of some large aggregations. And so this is kind of a first look at the scale of the aggregations. We found it useful in communicating our research program to talk about these uh, uh, eight major portfolios. You see four here, and, and the, the numbers you see off in the, uh, the far left column are the, uh, the magnitude of the investment in that portfolio in the Air Force's FY13 President's budget that's over on the hill right now. So no surprise, you see at the top of this that uh, the jet engines propulsion uh, from um, engines to hypersonic to air vehicles remains you know, a, a big area of investment for the United States Air Force, as is command and control, space, uh, and weapons. If we look on into some of the smaller portfolios, and I'm going to go through uh, and discuss the, uh, the major bets that we're making in each of these, uh, you can kind of get a sense of the scale proportion uh, in other areas that uh, uh, matter to the U.S. Air Force. So what I'd like to do now is, is start by going through uh, these major portfolios and, and touch on uh, where we're concentrating our dollars uh, and the particular programs we're trying to take on in each of these. So for command and control and ISR, um, this is a core competency of the Air Force. We range the world. Um, we, um, uh, we, uh, we surveil uh, on, on, on a global basis. Uh, and the, uh, the technical basis for this uh, and, the, uh, and the new demands range from uh, new sensing physics, uh, to um, uh, communications and, uh, and data links. But the problem broadly in, in the pivot to the Pacific and the contested, in, in, in the contested environment that that uh, theater recommend, uh, that, in, in, that theater brings to us, are the tyranny of distance and, and scale. Uh, the Air Force is responsible for conducting operations across all three war fighting domains, airspace and cyberspace, and the command and control challenge of synchronizing forces across these three, doma these three domains in space and purpose uh, for military effects is uh, a, uh, a, a technical and an operational challenge that we're trying to support. Airspace uh, and cyber domains each have profoundly different characteristics uh, with respect to speed, time, distance, uh, and the governing forces in physics. Um, and uh, the demands of modern conflict demand rapid, agile, assured operations to meet the decision-making needs of leaders, which are our customers uh, in this, this enterprise. So when we look at the major programs that we've got, the shift in the combatant command's needs from the permissive operating environment that we've been in over the past two decades of war uh, to a contested environment, uh, along with the maturation and major improvement in sensing capabilities, such as LIDAR imagery and improved hyperspectral imagery, lead to some remarkable new opportunities and choices for Air Force. One new sensing option that's really exciting is the inclusion and, and the exploitation of passive multi-mode coherent radar uh, that uh, we like to talk about as uh, silent radar technology uh, to enable uh, uh, GMTI, AMTI, uh, SAR imaging applications without uh, 
uh, direct transmission from the, uh, the sensing node, which is uh, a really lucrative feature in a uh, uh, integrated anti-access aerial denial environment of, of PACOM. And we're pouring uh, almost $100 million a year of investment into, uh, into those kinds of sensing physics, uh, LIDAR and passive multimode radar. Three of our core technical competencies are working in an integrated program that we call PCPAD-X. You'll hear about this uh, in a variety of, of our uh, portfolios, and I suspect General James might have uh, mentioned it or the problem set that we're trying to tackle. Uh, and it's a mouthful that means experimental planning, collection, processing, analysis, and dissemination X experimental. Uh, and it's a systematic introduction of human performance measurements and research of how to improve the cognitive reach and efficiency of PED intelligence analysts. Uh, and we do that by creating, um, you know, realistic but practical uh, human performance measures in combination with technical measurements of assessments of new processing codes and techniques uh, with the goal of dramatically improving efficiency effectiveness of our uh, highly stressed intelligence analysts. Uh, this program is uh, of, of great interest to the Air Force intelligence community, and we've got direct transition paths uh, into evolutions of our uh, major uh, 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 dissemination architecture uh, called the DCGS. Um, the, um, the exit criteria for, uh, for this area of research is, uh, uh, is the opportunity for the Air Force to, to um, evolve the, uh, the sensing physics of its ISR platforms uh, with the inclusion of uh, uh, things like uh, LIDAR and passive multimode radar, uh, and to take the touch labor, uh, to reduce the touch labor, increase the operating efficiency of uh, intelligence analysts uh, in the field and, uh, uh, and in our uh, intelligence analyst centers. Uh, so, uh, you, know, in, you know, round numbers, uh, investments of around $300 million a year. Um, the weapons enterprise. Um, this is a, a broad enterprise of need and research focus that uh, spans uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, and the major challenges that the Air Force has in weapons are in three broad categories. Again, the, uh, the uh, national strategy of, of pivot to the Pacific, uh, the accompanying air-sea battle operation concept represents a wide range of challenges, primarily driven by significantly increased adversary capabilities, operations over extremely long ranges, and adversary countermeasures that have not been accounted for in the current portfolio of weapons and platforms. These challenges essentially fall into three categories, broad categories. Insufficient strike capacity, fewer strike pla platforms, each with limited carriage capability compared to what our Air Force, Air Forces, Joint Air Forces have had uh, over the past decades. Um, and some uh, question of risk of platform and weapon survivability, uh, along with uh, reductions in lethality. So, you know, when we look at the, um, at the, uh, uh, at the future of the strike uh, Air Force fleet, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, intended to be the backbone of that fleet, uh, but the, the carrying capacity of, of an Air Force in the era of full JSF fielding uh, is, is only about 30% the, uh, the, the loadout capacity of the Air Force that we've got in the 90s and, and about half of what we've got today. So despite the significant increase in capability of the F-35 officers platform, the weapons development have not been tailored for its unique capabilities uh, and the trade-offs that come with operating that platform uh, in the Pacific theater in, in, the, uh, in, a, in a contested uh, environment. As a result, you know, the F-35 is largely unable to carry the quantity, the variety of the weapons of the aircraft that it's going to replace, and the current weapons portfolio wasn't designed with the F-35 in mind. So this presents a problem for us as the laboratory to, to create new choices uh, and to apply um, technology investments uh, to, uh, to open options up uh, for the Air Force and, and joint, uh, the joint users. Um, different dimension of the problem is for the past several decades, aerial platforms have enjoyed you know, near total command of the airspace and have operated with air sa as assets with near total freedom. Pivot the Pacific represents a major shift in the, in the capability needs as adversaries can now threaten U.S. Air Forces at greater ranges with uh, highly effective integrated defense and offensive capabilities that make control of the airspace exceedingly difficult to achieve. No surprise there. 
friendly air operation sanctuary regions will shrink and, and, exi and exist only at great ranges for potential targets and adversary threat ranges will infringe on U.S. first launch advantages. So um, this is a, a second distinct basket of problems. Uh, and then the, uh, the operations at very long ranges, increased emphasis on adversaries have placed on mobility and concealment, increases the need for reduced weapon time of flight, speed, creates uh, choices that uh, uh, can't otherwise be emulated, defeat of time-sensitive fleeting targets is a significant challenge over extremely large ranges. So these are, these are kind of technical challenges that uh, should not be uh, particular news to you. Um, our investments in this area uh, span all of the directorates of our laboratory. Uh, the weapons problem is a much bigger problem than, uh, than just uh, the, the good team down at Eglin that has largely led the charge here. So in the near term, we have a major program in uh, high velocity penetrating weapons that are seeking to drive the kind of um, penetrating, penetrating power into hard targets that comes with mass, uh, the tens of thousands, 20,000 pound class weight of, of MOAB into uh, small, smaller packages that can fit on the JSF and use uh, rocket speed and velocity to achieve the penetration that mass normally has. All this to underwrite uh, choices for a, uh, uh, a weapons program and hard and deeply buried targets. In the midterm, the high-speed strike weapons technology basket is, uh, is an investment focus to, uh, um, to create uh, choices for uh, a long-range cruise missile uh, to include hypersonic propulsion uh, and to, and to um, uh, see if we can uh, convince um, the, uh, the Air Force that, uh, uh, that the merits of speed are worth the, the consequences in terms of of um, red potential reductions in payload carrier capacity and all the other dimensions that uh, uh, that have to be done to create uh, hypersonic uh, weapons with you know thousand mile uh, kind of uh, ranges. So um, our major investments here uh, uh, span uh, propulsion as well as the uh, the integration of other support systems, uh, sensing structures, thermal control. Uh, and um, in terms of um, uh, new concentrations of, of, uh, of resource, uh, the high-speed strike weapons program represents a major shift in, in FY13 uh, from uh, previous budgets, uh, uh, largely being led by, uh, um, by OSD uh, interest and OSD sponsorship in the, uh, the uh, search for tools and weapons in, for the Pacific theater. Uh, let me shift uh, next to uh, uh, the area that I had identified as the, uh, the largest area of interest uh, and, and concentration of resources uh, in the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, I call it Next Generation Aerospace Systems, a, a blend of technical focuses from propulsion to uh, uh, airframes. Uh, and in this, in this area, we have um, the largest investment in the Defense Department in S&T, and it's our advent uh, engine program for our uh, and ADVENT is, uh, is a, uh, uh, adaptive, uh, an adaptive bypass ratio turbofan uh, that uh, has been a, uh, a technical goal for a long time. Those of you who understand jet engines know that, uh, uh, that the, uh, the selection of fan bypass ratio is a major engineering trade-off in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, turbofan engines. Uh, uh, engines for uh, crews, such as you see on airliners, are high bypass ratio. Uh, engines for uh, uh, supersonic uh, fighters uh, need uh, lower bypass ratios for high power, but we also want high bypass uh, for uh, loiter and uh, in range, uh, and we have to pick. And so uh, the focus of our ADVENT program uh, is uh, in-flight controllable bypass ratio, uh, and this has been a goal of uh, you know, remarkable engineering in, uh, in the fan and the engine controls. Um, and uh, we've, we've now got, uh, you know, right now, uh, the first of two cores at, uh, at, at uh, GE um, and um, Rolls-Royce Liberty Works are, are running in test stands. Uh, and so the, this program, uh, uh, along with its uh, follow-on to, to produce a, uh, uh, a core engine uh, by FY13 uh, or FY15, uh, is a, a, a prototype engine combining a, a fan, the, uh, the combustor, the augmenter, all in an integrated unit. Uh, is uh, our single largest bet uh, in the Air Force, uh, in Air Force S&T. Uh, and it represents a commitment to future CAF 
uh, propulsion that uh, we have to lead in our Air Force uh, because uh, we convinced ourselves that, that nobody else uh, will. Uh, other important uh, investments in this area of propulsion and aerospace systems are the, uh, uh, the propulsive technology for uh, hypersonic flight. Uh, you see in the, uh, in this, in the, uh, the image in the upper left, uh, the, uh, the X-51, we've flown three of those. Uh, we've learned something new from each one. We've got one more to fly, uh, and we plan to fly it in, in April to, uh, uh, to milk what we can out of uh, that set of, of test assets. Uh, it, this has uh, been the very first successful uh, hypersonic scramjet that burns hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, you see in the middle some interesting research, uh, cartoon diagramming interesting research we're doing about uh, energy efficiency, formation flying, uh, mobility airplanes. Uh, you know, it's a remarkable test out at Edwards. Uh, we demonstrated that uh, we could, in fact, uh, reduce fuel flow by uh, as much as 8 to 11 percent for those airplanes in trail and the climbing uh, sides of those, uh, of those vortices. Uh, and we could also do that with um, formation flying um, uh, geometry that was within the capacity of the existing autopilot in the C-17. Uh, all of this uh, aimed at uh, research in uh, reducing the demand um, uh, for fuel. Uh, and I talked a little bit about the high-speed strike uh, weapons program cartooned over there on the right. Uh, it largely a, a, a production, a propulsion investment um, that uh, 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 seeks to bring the risk down for uh, long-range uh, hypersonic uh, uh, propulsion. Uh, this is a program that we're just uh, beginning to, uh, uh, to work out with, um, with industry uh, uh, what, we want to, uh, what we want to field um, and, and do. Um, let's keep moving here. Our next portfolio in the, uh, the space in the nuclear business, um, uh, these um, uh, are largely spread around uh, three main themes here. Um, access, uh, we've got uh, some major investments in uh, uh, reducing the cost of access to space, um, in uh, payload technologies, uh, things that uh, create better choices for uh, um, both the NRO and uh, the Air Force's uh, Space and Missile Center in terms of engineering payloads. Um, and then um, space situational awareness, uh, the, uh, the information management, information exploitation, command and control of sensing, and information extraction for the surveillance of uh, what is uh, something like uh, 10 to the 22nd cubic miles of space containing 20,000 objects that uh, potentially matter to us. So uh, uh, stepping back through those, um, uh, those, um, those areas, uh, we've got, uh, in terms of access to space, uh, uh, we're attacking that uh, for both the, uh, um, uh, the, the space payload perspective uh, with um, uh, exploitation of our, uh, uh, we call it an ESPA adaptive ring, the, uh, uh, the interface uh, payload adapter that uh, the laboratory pioneered uh, some uh, 10 years ago, uh, and we're we're, we're fielding a series of experiments that exploit that, uh, that uh, almost uh, no-cost ride opportunity to space uh, for a, a variety of, of, of applications, most of which, uh, that, uh, most of which pertain to uh, uh, trying to improve the situational awareness at geostationary altitudes. The other dimension of, of access to space that we're investing heavily in uh, is preparing industry for uh, potential re-engineering of the RD-180 and the, RD, and the RL-10 engines in the ELV fleet, uh, both of which present to us uh, cost of ownership and sustainment risks that we would uh, prefer not to, to, uh, uh, to incur. The, uh, the manufacturability of the RL-10 has been getting harder and harder, um, and the RD-180, as good as it is, uh, is, a, um, is a policy risk that, uh, that the United States would like other choices for. Uh, and so uh, our research is investing in the, uh, the production, the design, uh, the, the, the engineering codes for um, uh, ox-rich um, uh, uh, rocket engines uh, in, uh, in an attempt to lay the tech base for a potential engine program uh, for the ELV. Uh, shifting back into uh, pervasive spacecraft component technology, uh, we uh, have got uh, major bets placed in uh, um, advanced uh, uh, infrared sensing, uh, hypertemporal methods that uh, offer some lucrative ability to see engine ignitions, rocket engine ignitions below the clouds, uh, exploiting uh, temporal signatures of, of uh, infrared radiation that, uh, uh, that actually uh, gets through clouds in a way that uh, 
um, uh, spatial contrast ratios don't. Um, we uh, have got uh, uh, a new growing line of research in uh, uh, in space communication. You know the uh, and this is a this is a, this is a, a bit of a shift in. Uh, um, in past years investment strategy, you know, when I was uh, at, at uh, Space Vehicles some 10 years ago, uh, it was our deliberate thinking that uh, space communications was a, uh, a commodity that the Air Force could be a consumer of. Uh, I think we've convinced ourselves that uh, in the area of protected communication, that certainly not turned out to be the case. Uh, and we are investing uh, more and looking to, to be more of a venture capitalist for protected communication, military unit communication than we have been in the past. Uh, and so this is an area that uh, um, I, 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 I won't call we've got a big bet placed, but we are, we are raising, uh, we're putting more chips on the table uh, for um, our ability to underwrite new choices in space communications. Uh, in space uh, surveillance, space situation awareness, uh, we, uh, we prototyped and will continue to invest in, uh, uh, in the means of exploiting uh, the sensor suite that the Air Force has got on the ground, uh, increasing its, uh, its sensitivity. You know, a, a remarkable uh, juxtaposition of opportunity has come to us from uh, uh, a, a, a DARPA LIDAR program, uh, and, and it's, it's dawned on us that it, it creates some opportunities for both airborne applications uh, in, uh, in sensors that can be put in pods and fighter sized airplanes and then running it through larger apertures uh, for uh, getting uh, sensing resolutions down into the centimeter range at geostationary altitudes, which is just a remarkably lucrative thing for our, our space uh, community and it makes a, uh, a uh, it, it, it takes advantage of, uh, of, of some DARPA investments in um, coherent uh, down conversion uh, and uh, fundamental uh, invention that, uh, uh, that they uh, underwrote uh, a few years ago. Um, I uh, only mentioned uh, the nuclear enterprise just in passing. Uh, largely, uh, our bet there is, uh, is in research on the surveillance of solid rocket uh, motor technology. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with how the Minuteman 3 program know, uh, is, has been run are, are witting that uh, we re-engineered Almost the entirety of the Miniman 3 program reported its motors, um, bought a new guidance computer, uh, put new warheads on it, setting up the ICBM force for uh, safe and sec secure nuclear deterrence uh, uh, past 2030. Uh, one piece that was left out, however, is the uh, inertial instruments, and so we in the laboratory uh, continue to make investments in, in um, inertial grade instrumentation with modern inertial instrumentation physics uh, all to the end of creating uh, a choice for when Global Strike Command wants to re-instrument the inertial measurement units of uh, the ICBM fleet. Um, so this are major bets in space uh, and nuclear. Uh, you know, cyber and communication, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, an area that, uh, you know, the Air Force is uh, paying close attention to uh, what we need to bring as, uh, as a joint Air Force. Uh, and in is, is a joint contributor, uh, and, and broadly speaking, the Air Force views its role is um, creating uh, global communication and global global cyber defense and offense. That is uh, uh, a uh, an Air Force role that's distinct from the other services. Um, we uh, have got uh, from our operational customers uh, a broad set of demands for uh, dissatisfaction with the global communication, especially the survivable communications that we will depend on uh, in the Pacific theater. Uh, and uh, this is an area that we are also increasing emphasis. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that we've got uh, our, our bets thought out, uh, but this is an area that we could use some collaboration uh, and, uh, uh, and invention. Um, broadly speaking, uh, the, uh, the confidence that, uh, that our operators have that uh, we'll have uh, reliable, secure communication uh, that's interoperable with the, uh, the force structure that we've got, uh, with the blend of joint weapon systems that we've got, and will work way over the horizon out of the Pacific is, is low. Uh, they would like us uh, to do things about it. Uh, in the cyber area, the Air, Force, uh, cyber, uh, the Air Force cyber strategy and our research strategy is largely oriented towards um, attacking um, uh, several major fronts. Uh, one is to, to decrease the attack surfaces that our networks offer the adversary, and, and we do that with um, experimental um, uh, experimental constructs in uh, 
uh, to, to use the, uh, the, the word cloud computing of uh, IP hopping, uh, polymorphic uh, instruction sets, and things that, uh, that make uh, the, the, st the static architecture of our network uh, dynamic um, and uh, increase the adversaries, uh, decrease the adversaries' ability to uh, depend on where they can get attack surfaces that they can exploit. And so we're actually constructing uh, experimental uh, uh, routers that uh, roughly mimic the AFNET uh, at a small scale to allow 24th Air Force to experiment with, uh, with oh, things like that. Um, on the offensive side, uh, our major bets are in the command and control and the scaling of offensive methods and the, uh, the command and control architecture that permits uh, the kind of, uh, of uh, uh, access search, uh, intrusion, and opportunity exploitation which uh, you know our cyber warriors know how to do, uh, but they they have to kind of prosecute those in, in, in the way the way I've internalized this as is kind of a one of at a time with uh, with a lot of uh, uh, of operator interaction with each one, and that's simply not going to work in a major campaign. Uh, and so our research is aimed at uh, uh, at uh, at uh, uh, automating and uh, and and scaling with uh, with software agents uh, methods uh, like uh, that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we have a, 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 a great interest in, uh, in uh, uh, generating and educating the next generation of cyber war, warrior and in creating the decision aids and the visualization tools that permit cyber operators to, um, uh, to have the kind of cognition and the, situ the situational awareness necessary to go prosecute a domain that is uh, uh, really uh, not intuitive and entirely uh, man-made. Um, in areas of, of, of security and trust and assurance, uh, our big bets are placed in, uh, in programs that, uh, uh, that are doing research in, uh, um, in um, uh, establishing root of trust uh, and um, um, uh, um, uh, the, the invention of, of ways to uh, assure trust and assure data integrity uh, on networks and components that uh, uh, you may not and, and are not likely to have the, uh, the hardware ownership and the, uh, uh, the integrity and, and custody uh, through their production life cycle. Um, uh, all of this uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, mitigate uh, risks that uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you are familiar with and, and, and have heard about in other contexts. Um, shifting a little bit away from investments and evolutions of programs we have to uh, increasing the value proposition of the force that we've got, uh, a major demand signal that we've got uh, to us in the laboratory is um, uh, uh, dr driving science and research into um, making owning the Air Force that we've got uh, a better value. Uh, and this is, uh, this is in um, uh, largely uh, uh, three big uh, buckets. Uh, in the near term, uh, our research is aimed at improving the methods of non-destructive uh, inspection, uh, both uh, metal structures, composites, uh, and particularly for low observables, which uh, uh, have got a, um, a disproportionately, uh, require a disproportionately high level of, of uh, sustainment labor. Uh, and these are methods that are things that we can turn into uh, inspection kits and tools and things that we transfer directly into the hands of, of, of maintainers. Uh, in the in the midterm, uh, you know, the Air Force is trying to shift uh, from a from a from a, a reactive strategy of sustainment. When I say reactive, it means that uh, you know we we tear airplanes down uh, either based on component failure uh, that occur in the field uh, or on a uh, a pre-planned uh, standing schedule. Uh, and we we've kind of convinced ourselves that the science uh, tells us that. Uh, um, if, we, um, if we have uh, better insight into the health of, of an airframe and an engine, um, we, can, um, we can do a better job of predicting, uh, looking into the future and predicting uh, uh, when we'll need to do uh, major investments of, of depot level uh, overhaul and, and repair. And in fact, you'll hear in the sustainment community uh, a word called high velocity maintenance. Uh, and high velocity maintenance uh, requires at its root uh, dramatically improved understanding of the health of the airframe uh, and the condition that it's in before it shows up at one of our LCs. And so uh, we in the laboratory are, are investing in a whole range of, of, of a structural and engine health monitoring 
methods that we can include in the airframe uh, and, and attach to the airframe for uh, sustained surveillance uh, in operations. Now, in the long term, uh, our research in affordability and sustainment uh, uh, point us towards uh, designing uh, and engineering methods that are explicitly organized for and motivated by uh, affordability. This includes, of course, uh, modern methods in uh, direct, direct uh, uh, di digital, digital material, digital additive material methods uh, that are suitable for, you know, aerospace applications in, you know, engines and high stress applications for, uh, for, for airframes, um, as well as uh, c um, manufacturing methods that are particularly suitable for uh, the, um, uh, you know, a certain number of, of, of high quantity uh, components that we depend on in the military, uh, AESA radar modules, uh, infrared um, uh, uh, sensors and detectors uh, in specific. Um, so this is an area of, uh, you know, round numbers, um, 130 or so million dollars a year for which uh, I'm not really satisfied with, uh, with the, the choices that we're, uh, we're putting out to uh, uh, to our Air Force, and, and I'd like to improve those uh, and could use uh, uh, help in that area. Um, last technical portfolio I want to, well, let's see, second to the last I want to touch on is electronic warfare. Um, no surprise that the, Pacific, the, the pivot to the Pacific places a premium on electronic warfare and electronic protection for operations and survival in a contested environment. Um, our research here is, uh, is, is exploiting um, um, uh, two main themes. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the geographic, uh, trying to separate uh, radiator from sensor and uh, spatial diversity, uh, much like I talked about in, uh, uh, in bi-static multi-mode uh, ISR, uh, in ways that, uh, that separate the vulnerability of radiation from, from the protector. Uh, and then uh, its, uh, it's kissing cousin of that is, uh, is self-adaptive uh, algorithms that, uh, uh, that are, um, um, in, in my own mind, uh, a, a response to the, uh, to the challenge that DERFMs extend to us uh, and uh, our dissatisfaction with the kind of long do loop of, of, of bringing uh, environmental samples back home to analyze before we turn those into offensive or defensive uh, countermeasure or, or ECM uh, to go back into the, into the algorithm. So self-adapting uh, environmentally uh, accommodating uh, algorithms, a very sophisticated level of, of, of information processing, but something that, uh, um, you know, the DERFM threat has thrown at us. Uh, another dimension of electronic protection that uh, we're, we're active in is extending the, uh, the, the, the kind of um, uh, ECCM um, methods uh, out of the RF environment into uh, directed energy and, and optical environments uh, as threats like uh, uh, long-range uh, IR search track uh, uh, appear to proliferate uh, uh, and optical, optical guidance uh, for um, uh, imaging IR missiles uh, launch from either man pads or, or ground vehicles that, uh, that present, uh, um, you know, um, new risks uh, and frankly uh, uh, exploit uh, um, limitations of our existing uh, optical uh, countermeasure and, and, and later and, and laser uh, threat uh, detection methods. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, we've got a, uh, no surprise, uh, a major challenge with our dependence on, on GPS. Uh, and we would uh, eagerly like uh, to find uh, methods and, and test and evaluate uh, opportunities for uh, uh, reconstruction of, and protection of timing, uh, as well as um, uh, position navigation without uh, uh, explicit continuous dependence on, on GPS satellites. Uh, so this uh, an area that uh, 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 largely motivated and amplified in, in interest from the, piv the pivot to the Pacific. Um, one more technical portfolio I'll touch on and then, um, and then wrap up uh, and see if there's time for questions. Uh, the whole dimension of human performance, I mentioned up front uh, that the 7-Eleven Human Performance Wing uh, with uh, its inclusion of the Brooks Medical Establishment has really created a, uh, a remarkably strong and, and expanding uh, uh, research center in the laboratory and I'm, and I'm pleased to have, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the leadership of uh, one of five uh, Brigadier Generals in the, um, in the Medical Corps, a, um, a, a flight surgeon named Tim Jex to, to lead this activity. Um, our, our, our efforts here at our big bets are aimed in, um, 
in, in a couple of major areas. Uh, one is our operators uh, have got a, a growing demand for live virtual training. Uh, the, uh, pi the, again, the pivot to the Pacific and the, uh, the demands for uh, operating in that contested environment have shown our operator that the, uh, the training methods that we've got, uh, the training range, uh, ranges, uh, as, as sophisticated as red flag, green flag are, uh, we really can't do a good job emulating the environment we think that they're going to face, especially the electronic and command and control environment. And they look to live virtual training um, as uh, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a necessary step, and that we in the laboratory uh, research, create, um, prototype, uh, evaluate, and in some case actually field prototype training tools uh, to the operators. And this is something the demand uh, is just growing uh, up for. Um, uh, like I had discussed in the PC Pad X program, uh, we also face uh, sustained demand for increasing the operator's cognitive ability. Uh, I talked about it in ISR, but also in, um, uh, in uh, uh, cyber operations and space operations. Uh, you know, the Air Force and Air Force operations is about uh, global reach uh, in environments which are significantly larger uh, in terms of scale uh, in space than, um, uh, than uh, um, you know, small-scale military operations and that we want to research and, and create the methods for, for visualization and decision-making aids uh, that let uh, air operators, uh, give air, air operators uh, the ca capacity to run things uh, on both a global scale with, uh, you know, high immediate resolution and ability to concentrate uh, on a, uh, a small scale problem anywhere in the globe. And this is, you know, a terribly dem de demanding um, um, dynamic range construct, if you will, about information. Lastly, in this area, uh, we are getting back into fundamental research in flight physiology. You know, this is an area that has been an Air Force competency since the beginning. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, th I think perhaps, uh, uh, you know, a decade or so ago, we started to think that uh, maybe we had uh, kind of run that out. Uh, the F-22 is starting to operate routinely above 20,000 or 50,000 feet. The sustained operation of U-2s uh, have told us that we've got uh, uh, a, a fair amount of uh, new learning uh, and new knowledge necessary to support continued operations at high altitude. Uh, and so although this is not a large area, it is a very important area of research and a major um, bet, if you would, of research investment uh, for the Air Force. Um, I want to close uh, here with, uh, with a bet of a different kind. Uh, and this is, this is uh, how we interact with the, um, with, with industry, with academia, with innovators like you. Um, and um, I'm not real satisfied in today's world with things changing as fast as they are in terms of the military problem, um, the, uh, the distribution of technical talent on a global basis, that uh, we do a good job of, of how we broker our problems with innovators and solution providers. And so I want to give a shout out to, um, to OSD who, who saw this as an area that they could contribute and they made an investment in, a, uh, uh, in an information, uh, in a research information brokering marketplace and this is what it's called, uh, the Defense Industry Marketplace. Um, uh, and, and you can find it on the web and it also uh, is an, uh, an, a partial answer to the new um, National Defense Authorization requirements for industry to report its IRAD. Uh, and so um, OSD looked for ways to go link what industry would be uh, reporting uh, with IRAD with what we as researchers would use uh, to go find, you know, who's doing work in some area and also to display for you in significantly more detail than, than I can or people like me can in conferences like this uh, for what our needs are and where our research interests are. So this is a bet that we in the Air Force Research Laboratory are going to jump in with both feet. Uh, we're going to go experiment with it. I'd encourage you to, uh, uh, to, to take a look, uh, see what you think, uh, give us feedback. Uh, because uh, it's really about improving uh, the ability to find um, solutions to problems and for researchers to find collaborators. Uh, and in fact, um, we're going to make a, a bit of an experiment of this uh, with um, our annual uh, exchange with industry that we call Right Dialogue with, with Industry. And we're going to uh, we're going to look for the, um, the 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 information context and, and kind of the prerequisite uh, of the um, 
of the basics of our uh, research programs uh, through that portal, and then we hope that we shift uh, this upcoming dialogue into a, a good bit more of a way, of a good bit more of a two-way communication with you and with researchers, uh, rather than as much kind of a one-way from the stage uh, out to you. So this is a bet of a different kind, uh, but it's also one that I'm, um, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about because, uh, uh, you know, cycle times are coming down, the attention span, the investment needs of our, of our, um, of our government, uh, uh, as you can well appreciate, are challenged, and uh, uh, things that we can do that, uh, that uh, shorten cycles, that, uh, that bring solutions to, to the field quicker, uh, and that uh, uh, accelerate the, uh, the innovative uh, pace are all things that we are charged to do in the laboratory, and I'm game to experiment with them. So um, if there's, uh, that, that kind of wraps up uh, a, um, uh, a review of, of our major bets. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not concentrated in as uh, many big chunks as, as say, a DARPA does, uh, but that's what we do in the Air Force Research Laboratory in terms of uh, trying to be responsive to the needs of our Air Force. If there is any time left, uh, Tom, um, uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions from any who might be interested, and I'd also encourage you, as large as this room is, there, there are microphones uh, down the aisles uh, to use those so that all might hear the questions. So, Tom, you'll have to watch the clock and let me know what we can do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's 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 um, that's General James challenged us, uh, 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 Tom, and and you know. Um, there, I, I, there's, there, I don't think there's one, there's one piece there. Um, I think there are, there are pieces of, op, of, of, of innovation opportunity for what I call them um, software tools that synthesize, correlate, and, and seek to, um, to do the kind of pattern matching that human brains are good at. So that's, that's an area that, that um, my own words, you know, the algorithm and the app designers are good at. Um, General James also comes to us and he says, you know, there are a lot of innovators out there for that. I have a hard time sorting them out. And so part of what he's also asked us to do is to create an evaluation framework that lets us test tools like that and grade them in an objective way in the presence of real operators. And so the, the, the essence of our PCPAD X program is, is, is not so much creating the design aids, but it's creating a framework that we can get quantitative feedback from real intelligence users on what makes a difference to them, and then put some evidence on the table so we can see what, to see what's working better. So there's, there's really these two halves to it, and, and, there's, and there's rich opportunities in, in both areas, I think. Okay, well, I must have talked long. I'm afraid uh, in the dark here, I wasn't uh, uh, keeping a good eye on what my watch was saying up here on the screen. So uh, thank you for um, letting me um, lay out what um, the research laboratory is doing for, uh, for the program. Well, General McCaslin, thank you very much for being our keynote speaker today. My we greatly pleasure. appreciate it, Neil. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick note as you're walking out the door, um, while we don't have an NHF panel this afternoon, tomorrow morning here uh, at the same time, 8 o'clock on the stage, uh, will be Dr. Werner Dahm, the Director of the Security and Defense Systems Initiative at the Arizona State University. And Werner will be speaking on establishing trust in autonomous aero systems. So please come. Enjoy your day. <laughs>